Thank you, Sophia. And thanks everyone for joining the talk. Uh, thanks for ADO for having me and good morning. Um, I'm Christian, I'm a senior software engineer at Source Labs working in the program, so open source program office there. And uh, if you have any question during the talk, please uh, post them immediately as we might not have enough time for my Q&A session. Um, so please post them immediately. All right, so today I want to speak about open source and would like to highlight to the human aspect of it. If you're working in open source, you're certainly not only writing code, you're also working with humans and particularly with communities, which is something that I find personally most exciting. I'm also a big fan of Humans of New York. And if you can already tell, my, my uh, design of my slides are aligned to the Humans of New York theme because I want to not only share some experience that I made over the last years, but also want to highlight some open source stories of people that I've met over the years and I appreciate um, for all the work they have done in the open source community. I would like to start with a session for myself. At my first conference, I felt like being backstage at a festival full of open source artists. There were always these moments where you would get starstruck if you would see that person who built that library working at that big tech company. However, Getting into casual conversations with them make you realize that they are just normal people like you and me. Being a passionate open source developer then eventually even brought me in situations where I would work with them, uh, with the same artists on a project together. It is fascinating how, how many doors just open magically when all you do is tinkering on a hobby project and share your passion with others. And the fact that this experience is accessible to everyone, if the community is built with good ethics, is the best part about it. The open source project, uh, the, the hobby project that I mentioned here is WebDrive.io, a project that has followed me around for almost the, my whole career. I started using that project during my university as I had to automate um, uh, tests for a single page application. Back then, uh, I started using the project more and more, eventually uh, found some bugs and found the, um, found, the, um, found the time to contribute back to the project which helped me to transition from an open source user to an open source contributor. There are so many different types of open source projects out there uh, that, you can, that you can interact with. Back then when I started contributing to WebDRL, it was pretty much a solo project, which is uh, currently 80 to 90% of all the open source projects you find out there, where there's one developer who is responsible for maintaining it. Now, almost eight years later, maintaining WebDRL, it has become a more monarchist uh, type of framework um, where all decisions are made by a project lead and small number of Leutnants. If I would get just more active contributors to the project, it might eventually become a community project. Selenium, if you have heard about uh, that project, Selenium is a typical community project where there's a clear governance structure um, that splits collaborators into technical leaders and project leaders, and all decisions are made democratically at all times. Then, of course, there are the big corporate projects like React, uh, where, uh, which is developed by Facebook, where the roadmap uh, of these tools and projects are dictated by a corporation behind it. And while there are corporate projects that are, have a more collaborative uh, discussion about roadmaps and project decisions, at the end of the day, the company has the last word. And of course, there are foundation projects like GraphQL, um, where the whole decision-making process is formalized and where consensus is found by a set of diverse people affiliated to different companies. Building communities is really different and it depends on the type of open source project that, you, uh, that you're working with. When someone pushes code to GitHub, that someone has a specific reason why that person does that and has specific expectations to it. Someone who just pushes a hobby project that um, they were working on during the weekend um, will probably, this will probably just stay a hobby project for the whole uh, lifetime of the, of the code. Um, and uh, on the other side, uh, big corporate projects have funding from big companies which are not likely to look into building a big contributor base outside. However, for projects that actually look for contributors to grow them to monarchist or community projects, some of the first problems to tackle are making the open source projects inclusive. Inclusiveness in tech has a special role already and it can fill a whole talk by itself. In this context, it means that 
contributions should not be should not only be allowed by senior developers who are experts in their field, but also by junior making them possible for junior developers and people people who just start with open source. I found four essential factors for making an open source project inclusive. Their scope, technology, documentation, and community. To keep the barrier low of understanding the code base, it often makes sense to split the code base into multiple packages projects. You see a lot of projects adapting learner and other monorepo uh, technologies that allow you to split certain problem spaces into certain set of uh, standalone packages. This helps you to reduce the cost of onboarding to the code uh, as well as the, uh, the code, uh, the problem space itself. Then technology, um, where it is always amazing if you can use the latest and greatest from the language ecosystem, but be aware that certain technology choices might affect your contributions from, from outside. For example, if you add TypeScript to your JavaScript project, or if you add a build dependency that maybe works in Mac, but not on Windows. People have, that want to contribute to the project need to know what TypeScript is and need to understand how to set up that complex build dependencies to get started contributing to your project. Your technology choices should be always um, if reflect uh, what kind of contributors you expect uh, your projects to um, get contributions from. Then of course, there's the documentation parts where it's not only important to have really well-written user-facing documentation, but as crucial it is to have also well-written contribution guidelines that not only explain what kind of contribution you expect from outside collaborators, but also how those contributions are supposed to be made. And lastly, there's this community aspect um, where you want to always have a welcoming language for any kind of contributions. It's one thing to give someone a thumbs up on a PR, but a whole different if you write a personalized thank you message for someone who first time contributes to a project. After you spend some time making your project a little bit more inclusive, it's time to go out and talk to people about it. Someone who has an interesting story to share about exactly that is Dan. He wrote, I was selected to present at SeleniumConf in London about an entirely different topic. Uh, and during my presentation, I had shown some examples using Selenium to drive iOS devices. Several people came up to me after the talk and were more interested in the iOS demo than what I was actually presenting. And one of them said, I should do that demo as a lightning talk later in the conference. So I signed up. And the next day, I took the stage. The lightning talk host had mentioned in the rules for the talks that speakers had 30 seconds to get their presentation going, or they would be passed over for the next speaker. As my luck would have it, my MacBook didn't like the projector. The host started a countdown, and just after he said one, the presentation finally showed up on the projector and the rest is history. A few months later, the same lightning talk host would form a group to start a new open source project based on the demo I gave at the conference. And eight years later, Appium is still going strong. It's amazing to think about that this project Appium would probably never have existed if Dan would never have been able to show up to show the presentation and, and get the projector running. Appium is one of the biggest mobile automation frameworks that exists today and the revenue source of so many companies in the automation space. Now that you got people excited about your new project, it's time to collaborate, which comes with, their, with, its, uh, with, with its own challenges. Particularly, if you have been working on this project as a sole and only contributor, you start to create some sort of context around certain problem spaces and the code areas. You probably know this best. If you, if you have been working on the code base for multiple years, you exactly know where to fix a bug and where to look in the code to add a feature. This context is important to document for outside collaborators if you have an open source project. Bo Lotto, who's a psychologist, said on this, context is everything. Your brain does not do absolutes. Your brain only does relationships. That's all it ever does, and that's all it ever can do. So future collaborators might be able to see all information by looking into the repository, into the code, and into the problem space, but all these information are pretty much useless. As long as they can't refer to the context, contributors 
have no access to what they are looking for. So as a maintainer, we have the obligation to not only document the dark box, but also provide as much context as possible. I have a really bad example for myself, actually, a couple of years ago, where I just created an issue for the Web.io project saying implement Jasmine Runner. In my head, everything was clear. I just do it similar as I did with Mocker, and it will probably turn out well. But for outside collaborators, this is like useless, and this is like not helpful to get started helping out on the project. Context is king. You can make your, a test by yourself and go to the Fortran or Haskell open source projects from the NASA GitHub organization and look into the issues and the code. If you're a web developer like me, you will be like, what kind of language is that? And, and what kind of, what is this project even doing? So providing context is really essential to allow contributors to even get started looking into the issues. It, I learned over time that it makes more sense to spend five to 10 minutes to really give context to an issue, um, give a description about current and desired state, link to code that is objective to change and include issues um, if, to increase the context, then spending 30, 30 minutes to fix the issue by myself. It's also always good to uh, add contribution guidelines and, and, and um, uh, highlight the issues that are well-groomed and that are good for people to, who want to get started. Along the way, it's of course critical to be always helpful. Another bad example from my past is where I got constantly the same issues all over again about a deprecation notice. And I started to shorten my answer over and over because I got frustrated and worked out about, um, about those issues. And I deserved a 34 don't vote issue uh, uh, post. I learned that I, when I get worked up by maintaining a large open source project, um, I should step out. Um, I always have to, uh, I learned that I only have, to, I should do constructive comments or no comments at all. I should never lose my kindness in all the interaction that I have with the community. And if I feel burned out because maintaining an open source project can be an additional burden to your day-to-day -day job, I should take a break. And of course, if the same question and issues come up every, every time, there is a problem with the project and a FAQ might help to resolve this. John Harband, who, who is working, uh, who's part of the TC39 uh, team, he said once this, he said, I want to look back at my life at any point and feel generally positive about what I've done, what I've built and who I've interacted with and how I left them feeling. So again, if you feel burned out maintaining an open source project, just step back, take a pause for a week and get back to it with fresh mindset um, and enthusiasm. Another way to build up the community is of course, to also provide them a home using tools like Gitter or Slack. This can be difficult in the beginning because you have to spend a lot of time answering to people and, and being there and, and, and gathering the folks but it can be super helpful uh, for people to share their experiences and support each other over time. You will see that there will be some people who rather spend time in the community channel rather than contributing with, um, with uh, code patches. And this is the same equal um, contribution to a project um, than having code, uh, in my opinion. Someone in the Rotor project who really stepped up and became a really strong supporter for a lot of people from the Rotor project is Olga. And she wrote to me this. My introduction to the energy and vitality of open source communities occurred when I had an opportunity to attend the Selenium conference in Boston. I would been working with Selenium for several years using Java or C Sharp when I first got started with the Rotor project. Having developed a framework gotten a taste for the power and flexibility of using JavaScript for UI automation and worked through several WebDevIO version upgrades, I discovered that not only was the Gitter WebDevIO channel a great resource for knowledge exchange for the community, but that, that I was always often able to answer questions on the channel myself. This further increased my confidence and deepened my own understanding of the project structure. And eventually I was able to commit a few changes to the project. Throughout, I've enjoyed the chance to chat with and get to know the web uh, users from all over the world. This is just an, 
so much inter so interesting example of someone who starts contributing um, through this community channel and then go um, technically to also make qualitative uh, code contribution to the project themselves. Which brings us to the next chapter three, which is lead and inspire. Once you build a little community, you will still have only a few people that who, uh, who will actively work on the project. And these few people have to inspire the community with their actions by giving back. It is important to give back, to provide some success moments, moments and reward people for their engagement. This not only increases incentives, it helps them to continue contributing to the project. One of the things that I explored is to just give everyone who uh, made a meaningful contribution to the project access to the GitHub organization. There's really no reason to close up a project organization and make it an inclusive club. If you invite people, um, you make them part of the community. And this is really rewarding for a lot of people. Um, it is also important that you provide information about the trajectory of contributions that someone made over the time. Um, that could be part of your governance um, uh, description. It's similar uh, in your own job where you want to know where your career goes uh, when you start, when you continue working at the company for a longer time. Another excellent utility to give back to the community is to open, uh, to offer open office hours. Um, I use this to connect on a weekly basis with individual contributor um, on individual issues. I use the Calendly app to just block some hours in, my, in the week um, to really connect and pair with them one-on-one. -on -one. While, while this requires a lot of time on your side, it has a high return on the investment because you not only teach individual contributors to the code base, you also provide them with all the necessary context that is needed to fulfill their tasks. And over time, the quality of their contribution will increase more and more. Lastly, once you have built up your community, once your project started to impact the ecosystem, you want to think about governing your project at scale. And some ways you can do that is to join a foundation, like the OpenJS Foundation, the Apache Foundation, or the Software Freedom Conservancy. Those foundations can help you with legal issues, with marketing, uh, with governance, financially, as well as collaboration with other foundation projects. But don't join a foundation just to put their logo on your website. Join a foundation as a growth goal and as a, a goal to also support the foundations, uh, the foundation in their efforts to create a bigger community um, at large. I want to end up um, sharing um, uh, something that Joey Burson wrote to me. Um, she said, make 10 different shelters with this old tire, some wood and a piece of rope. This kind of design exercise tests resourcefulness and encourages you to think about the nature of the individual components and what happens as they combine. To me, working in open source and open standards is very much like that sort of puzzle. We may use the same tools, people, process, policy, code, et cetera, but the results can, be, can look a lot different. This industry has helped me to, to appreciate this quality and work in a more systemic way, less like an engineer, more like a painter. How do tools combine to solve the immediate problem and also celebrate differences and respect surrounding context? It's creative, rewarding, and not without frustration or failure. You have to be willing um, to, to work on multiple timelines, try new things, and change your perspective. And patient helps. With that, I want to end and thank you everyone for participating. And um, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or on GitHub. Thank you everyone.